Hello, everyone. My name is Dr. Katherine Garforth from Garforth Education, and this is the Right to Read initiative, a webcast and podcast that is about trying to spread information on how we can support our students' right to read. Our uh, topics are based on the Ontario Human Rights Commission's Right to Read public inquiry and their recommendations. Today, I have the pleasure of being joined by Nathaniel Hansford from Pedagogy Non Grata again, and we're going to be talking about reading comprehension. So good afternoon. Nate, how are you today? I'm great. It's good to be back on your show. Thank you. Do you want to give listeners a little bit of an understanding of who you are and what you do before we dive in? Sure. Yeah. Uh, I'm a school teacher and a nerd. Uh, I teach grade eight right now, uh, although I've taught basically every grade. Um, I co-started the podcast Pedagogy Non Grata, and that was all about trying to take a real hard evidence-based look at education, which has led me down the path of really specializing in the science of reading topic. Um, although I have looked at other areas of the science of learning and teaching. Um, and as I've specifically focused in on the area of meta-analysis um, because we have so much variability in the field of education and our, our research studies, it really... For some reason, your volume's not working. Can't hear you. Hmm. We're having technical difficulties at the moment. Um, maybe you've disconnect and reconnect. Um, so anyway, today's conversation is on reading comprehension and reading comprehension is one of the five pillars of reading where there is phonemic awareness, phonics, vocabulary, fluency, and comprehension. Now, none of these pillars are standalone topics, and they have to have support from other things. So when we've spoken with Nate in the past, we've looked at um, phonics instruction, we've looked at vocabulary instruction yesterday, and we've looked at fluency instruction. So today we are planning on looking at reading comprehension, if we can get the audio working. Is my mic working now? Yeah. Awesome. Okay. So I was just finishing saying who I am and it's just talking about how um, I think it's really important to look at meta-analysis because we can't look at individual studies in education. And to give us an example of this, I think anybody listening to your podcast knows that phonics is evidence-based and that balanced literacy is not. But there are individual studies in which balanced literacy programs have done phenomenally well. And there are individual studies that show um, phonics has done negatively in, in the terms of it, the control group outperformed the treatment group in the study. And there are bad actors out there who will interpret that data and say, look, I found a study proves phonics doesn't work. Um, but we don't look at that. Uh, we don't take that viewpoint in science. We say, what do majority of studies show? And we do that using systematic approaches, such as meta-analysis. Um, and that's why it's really important. That's why you can't just pick one study or, or um, base what you're saying on, on anecdote, because we have so much variability when it comes to education. Uh, and I, I will say, uh, whenever I put out a meta-analysis uh, review or do my own non-peer-reviewed one, I always get a flood of like messages being like, did you consider this study? And my response is always like, I don't look at individual studies. Um, I look at what do the majority of studies show? Um, so today uh, we're gonna be talking about comprehension and I'm gonna be taking a meta-analytic perspective about what does the majority of the scientific literature show about comprehension instruction? And I will be honest with you, I have three meta-analyses to talk about today. And I'm much more happy when I talk about something like phonics where I have like 15 and I can be much more confident in the things I say. But um, if it's okay with you, I could start the presentation. Sure, go for it. Awesome. Okay, so before I even really start going through the data, I wanted to talk about um, just the idea of comprehension instruction. And mm -hmm. I'm gonna be honest with you, I have kind of this love-hate with comprehension instruction relationship with it. 
And that's in part because uh, I find the number one question I get asked is, I have a student, they can read, they can read great. Their decoding's fine. And um, they really struggle with comprehension. And that, that answer to me or that question doesn't provide me with enough information. And I often see that, and I think balanced literacy has in part driven this, this idea that um, students are there, they can, they can read, but they really struggle with their comprehension. And I find they usually can't read the way people think they can. And I think there's usually a couple of things going on. First off, my first question that I always want to ask them is, when you say that you know they can decode, are you sure? Did you give them a decoding assessment? Or are you saying because you've heard them read, you think they can decode? And usually when people ask me this question, it's the second. Not always, but usually. Um, so I think the very first thing you should be doing when you have a student who's struggling to understand what they're reading is check, do they know their 44 most common English sounds and their sound representations? Um, and then once they know the answer to this question, then my next question is, are they reading with fluency? Because if they're not reading with fluency, um, I don't think the comprehension is likely to be the outcome or the problem. So for example, and I believe actually when you came on my podcast for the first time a couple of years ago, you were the one who first pointed this out to me and I was asking you the silly question, but um, if the student is reading, but they're decoding every other word and they're sounding out their words and they're not reading with automaticity, um, of course, they're going to struggle with their comprehension. It's because um, the amount of bandwidth that they're spending on trying to figure out all those individual words prevents them from understanding the meaning of the sentence, let alone the paragraph. Because by the time they get to the end of the sentence, they've already forgotten what all the other words are. They're not focusing on the meaning of the paragraph. They're just trying to survive the paragraph that we're putting in front of them and trying to get to the end of each individual word. Um, and that is not a comprehension program pro problem. Sorry, That is a fluency problem or it is a decoding problem. Um, and I find that this is most likely to be the most um, likely source of a problem. And then on top of that, I don't love, I think one of my biggest problems with balanced literacy, I mean, so many people look at three queuing as the big problem with balanced literacy. Um, I don't think balance, or three queuing is helpful. I'm not aware of any significant scientific literature saying, saying it works. Um, but that being said, it's not my biggest problem with balanced literacy. Um, my biggest problems are one, that's not systematic, explicit phonics instruction. And two is this strange um, focus on comprehension. I've you know heard of teachers in kindergarten being like, what is the main idea of the text and wanting the kids to write down the answer to that? Well, if the kid doesn't know their alphabet yet, teaching them comprehension makes about zero sense to me. And there's an exception and a caveat to that. I, I don't like to talk in extremes, um, but it's, it's more like, where do we focus our instruction? Should we teach some comprehension in kindergarten? Maybe. Um, I'm not advocating that we teach zero comprehension, but what does that look like? I would imagine that it should be oral questions only, not written questions. It should be simplistic questions and it should be from books we're reading out loud to them. Like I would not have a dedicated comprehension period. I would say if you're reading a story to your kindergarten students, yeah, ask them like a couple of comprehension questions like, what was the story about? What happened next? What happened then? Or maybe pause for a second. What do we think is gonna happen next? That's fine. That's totally fine. And I think actually through the primary years, that should be the majority of comprehension instruction. And I think we should slowly increase it over time. And this is me talking about my personal opinion though, um, because I can't speak to this very um, authoritatively based on the scientific literature, because I don't think the scientific literature does a great job of answering this question. And I'll explain why in a few minutes. But I, I think one of the things that you're bringing up that's really important, you know, boils down to the simple view of reading that reading comprehension is a product of word recognition and language comprehension. And, you know, those first problems that you were saying that you asked teachers about first, about their, can they decode and can they read fluently? You know, those fall under the word recognition category. And so no matter how good their language comprehension is, if you are asking them to read the text themselves and they have poor word recognition, their language comprehension is going to be affected. Yeah, um, and I agree with that. And then the one other thing I, I dislike about the conversation that sometimes happens with comprehension instruction, and it, it has to do with the na nature of the idea in itself. 
And I had a conversation with this about Dr. Timothy Shanahan, which I'm, I'm honored to have because I think he's so, so brilliant. Um, and he, he kind of had the same perspective in that a lot of comprehension is natural um, in the sense that if most of the texts that we're asking very young children to read are not complex. If you have a story about the dog jumping over the moon to go get a bone, for lack of a better <laughs> a story, um, and the student understands the words in the story, it's unlikely that they don't understand or comprehend the text. And I think sometimes what we're really asking is not can the student comprehend, but can they express comprehension? And that's more about their ability to communicate and less about their ability to comprehend. And focusing the instruction on their comprehension with very simple text so that if they know the words and they speak English and they grow up in an English speaking household, they probably understand what it's about. Um, it doesn't seem to make a ton of sense. So that's why I think comprehension in the primary years should be very minimal in the instruction amount. And I wanna be clear, I'm not saying zero, I'm saying minimal. And I, I think this is sort of, I, I think it's sort of the, uh, and it goes in this inverse relationship. The older students get, the more time we're gonna spend on comprehension and the less time we're gonna spend on word work. Whereas the younger they are, the more we wanna spend on word work, the less time we wanna spend on comprehension. There's this inverse relationship. Um, and this is where I, I start to say, I have this love hate relationship because Despite saying, you know, I don't want to see a lot of people teaching comprehension. I used to be uh, a high school English teacher and majority of my time at the high school level of English, especially for my students who are going on to university, was spent teaching them comprehension strategies and writing skills. Um, but I don't think that that's appropriate, say, in a grade one class. I think we need to take a very different approach. So if it's okay, unless you have a question or a comment about that, I can start diving in a little bit more into the research. Uh, no, I think it's good to go more into the research. I mean, we just have to think of what is developmentally appropriate for the child at the time. And we're not going to teach them how to, you know, really dig deep and under those surface layers to whole class in those primary grades, because the, if, unless you're at, a, you know, a, an elite private school, the children aren't going to be ready for it. Yeah. And you might have a kid in your class. I, mm -hmm. I'm teaching green A right now. I have a student who will ask me questions about like the philosophy of economics and advanced statistics. That kid is brilliant. And I can have those conversations on the side with him, but um, I'm not going to have a lesson to my class based off that one student's ability. So um, if I get my computer to work, uh oh, oh, that's why I'm on the wrong page. It was at the end. Uh, I had gone straight to the end of my conversation. So this is a, a graph from a, a meta-analysis done on um, comprehension instruction. And I'm forgetting the name of the author right now. I forgot to write this down, uh, but uh, it is on my website. If we want to check, if you want to take a look at it later, anyone, um, or I can happily uh, write this down later to someone asking. But um, to best of my knowledge, there's only been one meta-analysis done on comprehension instruction purely. Uh, and it was done quite recently. Uh, it was done within the last three years. So you see that we have the, the biggest effect for teaching main idea. And when I first published this on my website, um, people were very upset about that point because they're like, that's what everyone teaches. Um, and I mean, part of that is probably that's what everyone teaches because it's probably the most important thing. Um, although, you know, one thing, teaching main idea isn't really a, a teaching strategy. It's something we want the students to be able to do. So it's, it's kind of funny to me that this was included because it's not really a strategy. It's so much as a, I think we have to teach. Like we do need to teach students how to do main idea or find the main idea. And I would assume the reason why it comes out so high is actually most comprehension assessments are gonna ask the students, what is the main idea? Um, so yeah, I mean, you do have to cover that for the students to learn it. Um, and this is, I think, where when we get into the secondary levels where students start to struggle, it's easy to like give the kids the three little pigs and ask them what the main idea is. Um, it's another thing to give them the Canterbury Tales and ask them what the main idea is or give them Shakespeare. And that's why uh, it's uh, really important in secondary. And it, I don't think it's that important in primary. Um, so strategy instruction, this is more important, uh, is giving them different strategies to try and think about how to comprehend the text. And I'll go over the one that I believe is the most evidence-based on the next slide. Um, but in general, trying to give kids frameworks to think about something rather than just be like, let's practice finding main idea. Let's practice finding perspective. If we can have some kind of framework where we approach that, 
just the same as when you give students a, a challenging math problem or word problem, you might use schema instruction to try and um, teach the students to have a process for, for um, understanding that problem or that question. We, we should be doing the same thing in um, comprehension instruction. Would that be including like graphic organizers? I, I believe graphic organizers is on here. And actually that had the lowest one, but the effect size of it is actually decently high. And I, I said this previously, we typically see lower effect sizes in language instruction. Um, so I would, if this was a math meta-analysis, I'd be like 0.45 is pretty low, but for reading instruction, I'd say 0.45 is, is, is decently high. So we, we see a, a very a positive effect from giving kids graphic organizers. Um, I, I hate the fact that text structure, like teaching the students about like paragraph format and stuff um, did so well. I've never thought that makes sense to be beneficial. My curriculum in my, my province explicitly tells me I have to teach that, but um, that, that was one of the ones um, looked at. Metacognition strategies is, a, is an interesting one, and that's training the students to think about how they learn about a problem. It's kind of similar to schema or strategies. Uh, technically, as an example, growth mindset is technically a metacognition strategy. Um, it's trying to promote a mindset around solving the problem. Um, but there's, a, I'm sure, hundreds of different metacognition strategies out there. And it doesn't specifically in this meta-analysis identify which ones to use. Um, but we can, we can assume that it's helpful. Um, teaching back, background knowledge um, without having a strategy to go with it produced an effect size of 0.59. Um, that's, that's interesting that giving students background information is, is important. Um, and then I think it's kind of fun. We got predictions in here, um, retelling instruction, inference instruction, and main idea all in here. But realistically, these are all things we have to teach. Same as we need to teach perspective and bias. Um, and under, for, so for example, for perspective, giving a, a kid a newspaper and being like, who's, uh, whose perspective is this person writing the newspaper from? Are they writing this from a Western perspective? If say we're looking at the war in Ukraine, not to try and pick on the war in Ukraine, or are they looking at this from a Ukrainian perspective or a Russian perspective, getting the students to be able to identify this stuff. That's really important. Um, although that would be more of an example of more towards high school level question. We see it in Ontario curriculum, grade seven, grade eight, but it's, I would say more of a high school problem. Um, but these are all things you need to teach. So inferences, retelling, which is basically summarization. Um, we have to teach that. I don't think you can skip teaching summarization. So I wouldn't worry about if, um, summarizing has a high effect size or a low effect size, you have to teach it. So, um, the one I really want to point to is this grade nine to grade 12 um, comprehension instruction on reading outcomes overall shows an effect as a 0 0.67 versus 0 0.47 in grades three to eight. And we can see we don't get a very clear picture because we don't have enough grades in here, but we can sort of see a fairly obvious trend and that the lower grades show lower results than the higher grades, which I think goes along with that, that sort of narrative I was telling earlier, but we probably shouldn't be spending a ton of time of co on comprehension in the lower grades. I think grade seven, eight is when you really should start to ramp up your comprehension instruction personally, especially if all of your students are at grade level of reading. Um, and I think we should start probably introducing a little bit more in grade two and grade three and slowly going up over time. But by the time they, they reach grade nine, I would say it should be a pretty dominant part of your, your curriculum and your instruction, whereas uh, it should be the opposite in the younger grades. So I'm um, oh, sorry. Not, not, this is not based on, this is personal anecdotal yeah. comments towards this, but if you look at executive functioning development, which is the, the thinking about thinking, and it gives you those metacognitive strategies that you need for comprehension, you're not seeing those higher level strategy or um, executive function speak in development until those preteen high school years so asking them to dig deeper and use skills that they don't have yet, you know, it makes sense that you're not saying that the largest effect in the younger grades, because not all of the students are at a level where they have the skills to do that. Yeah, and that makes complete sense to me. I've taught, I've taught every grade. Currently, I'm teaching intermediate. We spend a lot of time on comprehension and intermediate. Uh, I would, not as much as I would say in a high school classroom, but still a very significant amount of time. 
And I've taught grade six. And I think grade six is really that transition year where we really start to increasing a little bit more. And by grade seven, eight, I would say it's a very dominant part of the curriculum, but not quite as much as in high school. And I would say by high school, I, it's probably about 50% of what I'm teaching is comprehension. Um, whereas it might be like 5% in, in, in grade one in kindergarten. So of this, we're talking about strategies being the most important thing, giving kids a, a, a framework for teaching um, uh, a comprehension question. And uh, to the best of my knowledge, there's only one specific strategy that's been very well studied within literature. And that doesn't mean that there's not other really great strategies out there, um, but there's only one that's been well studied to the best of my knowledge. And that's reciprocal um, teaching. So uh, reciprocal teaching is, I'm going to just quote here so I don't make any mistakes when I say, but a reciprocal teaching is an instructional strategy which aims to foster better reading comprehension to modern students who struggle with comprehension. The strategy contains four steps, summarizing, questioning, clarifying, and predicting. It is reciprocal in that the students and the teacher take turns in leading a dialogue about the text and the question. Asking questions following each of these four steps, the teacher can model first the four steps, then they reduce their involvement so that the students can take the lead. Um, and this is often also pitched in the idea of first the teacher models, then they do it in groups together, and then they do it on their own independently. And it, realistically, this is just a, a very specific model of the gradual release of responsibility idea for um, comprehension instruction. And I, I completely agree with this. Uh, I've yet used an RTI framework to teach um, comprehension in the past at the high school level. And I remember being very skeptical of it at first. Um, and RTI has you like monitor data and you change your teaching over time to match basically your students' needs. And what I found using that approach, um, which I highly recommend by the way, uh, is that when I first started, I wanted to do most of the instruction. I wanted to just model until they got it. Like I wanted to like read them a text ask them what the theme was, for example. And of course they couldn't identify the theme. So I immediately told it to them. Um, and what I found worked better, and you do have to do that. You have to have that modeling, you have to have that group discussion. But I think the more important part is the practice and giving them a lot of practice and a lot of exposure to different texts. So I actually, I hate poetry. Uh, this is a bias as me as a human being, I hate poetry. But I think poetry works phenomenally well for comprehension instruction because it's short and it's abstract. So it's very hard for kids to immediately grasp and understand the answer, um, but you can do like a lot of different poems over a short period of time. Um, so giving a student, say a poem, asking them, what is the main idea? Who is the perspective? What are the inferences in it? And then seeing if they can get the answer to that question, you have them break off into groups or on their own, depending on where you are in the unit, give them that practice and then take up the answers at the end of class, but focusing mostly on the practice time. And, and I would say, yes, definitely start off with the uh, modeling, you have to model these types of skills first. They're not going to be able to pick it up like that. And, and this is where, you know, I was talking about like Dr. Timothy Shanahan saying, you know, there's no real point in using direct instruction for comprehension of the primary grades, because if they can read the words, they can understand the text. But when we get to the older grades and we have these abstract texts, then all of a sudden it makes sense. And then they really do need that direct instruction, but they also, in my opinion, more importantly, need the practice. And it's just about giving them enough practice time to accomplish that. Um, so unless you have a comment about that, I can just go over a very, very brief synopsis of the literature on this topic. Um, I was just gonna say that it sounds very much like Dr. Anita Archer's, I do it, we do it, you do it mantra, right? Yeah, 100%. Um, and I just think the most important part is that we do it and that you do it. Um, and the, yes, you have to do the, I do it. Um, but I think we, we, it's important to limit that, not to get too caught up in that, that phase. And I think it's very easy, especially if you're a high school teacher and you've spent like four years of your, your life studying literacy on our literature on like a high level. And then you get to your first high school class and like, you're trying to expose them to really deep thoughts and texts. And you just want to stand at the front and lecture them. It's a huge mistake. They need that practice time. Um, yeah. So uh, there's only been two meta-analysis of this, to the best of my knowledge. Um, I'm basing this on uh, John Hattie. This is, that was John Hattie's quote, by the way, earlier. And this is John Hattie's summarization of the literature on this specific topic. So, but we have a mean effect size of 0.74 for both of them, which is 
higher, I believe, than everything else on that graph I just showed you on comprehension in general. So this is a, a really high yield strategy. And the fact that we have two different meta-analyses coming to the, the same conclusion, uh, I think is important. And I think we have a decent number of studies. So we have um, 38 studies total and the consistency. It's pretty rare where you see two meta-analyses come out with like the exact same effects. So like never happens. Everybody has like, based on the inclusion criteria they have, everybody comes out with a slightly different number. Um, yeah. So that, that really summarizes my thoughts on comprehension instruction. And I, I really want to make the caveat that we don't have enough information uh, to speak about this authoritatively. So the only things I feel like I can say with authority is that it works better in older grades, that um, reciprocal teaching is the most evidence-based strategy, and that giving students a framework to answer questions is important. Um, and then everything else I've said to you for the most part is my personal thoughts and anecdote. Although I do personally very strongly believe that comprehension instruction should be limited in the early grades. Yes. Well, and when we take a look at this stuff, it is more theoretical approach and looking at those five pillars, again, as I was saying earlier, all of them are required. Even if we look at the simple view of reading or Scarborough's reading rope. Comprehension is the end goal and has so many factors involved. So one of the difficulties when we're studying comprehension strategies is we're not really just looking at comprehension, right? Because we can't isolate that variable. So There's hard. too many factors that play into it. So when we're looking at doing interventions in small group, or individually with students, we really need to have a better understanding of that student's individual needs. Uh, as teaching in that, that tier one setting, it's understanding your class and making sure the scaffolding's in place and circulating while it's happening, being cognizant of your weaker students and checking in with them more so you can provide that second layer of scaffolding. Mm -hmm. um, still in that tier one strategy or um, instruction, but you know, that circulating and monitoring and discussing with your students while some of the other students that have it down, they can still do it on their own and go at higher uh, paces. Yeah, that's, that's a really good point. You can, you can always enrich for your, your, your top students. In fact, I really advocate that you do. I think mm -hmm. that's really important. I think sometimes I think the one thing that I feel like special education gets wrong is that we we spend, we, we, we rightfully so focus on the students that need the extra support, but we should also be providing additional instruction to the students who can benefit from enrichment. That's just. Yeah. Well, the gifted and twice exceptional uh, side of special education is often left out and often forgotten because, you know, they do okay, quote unquote, but they're not meeting their potential and that's not okay. Yeah, I, I agree. Yeah. And they're not being supported to get them to that next level that they're capable of. Yeah. I mean, if we have a, uh, if you have a little Einstein in your class, don't you want them to see, see them invent some amazing technology or reach their full potential or I don't know, cure cancer and know that you had like one tiny 1% part in that. I'm sure that all the credit goes to the student, but you still want to do everything you can to help them reach that, that potential. Yes, of course. Well, thank you so much for joining me today in our conversation about comprehension. We are looking to the future to schedule ones about phonemic awareness. So one of those, the last of the feet, uh, sorry, five strategies that we haven't spoken about yet, and also morphological awareness and morphological instruction. Uh, because it is mentioned in the recommendations and it is a very important part of ways that we can support our students in their reading and comprehension development, but it's not understood by a lot of people. Uh, at least that's my take. I didn't know it was a thing until you told me about it, <laughs> but uh, I've actually, I feel like I've studied it quite well. I actually, I feel like I know way more about the efficacy of morphology than I know about morphology itself. So I can tell you all about the research into why you should study it or, and teach it but I'm not too knowledgeable like yourself on the actual morphology in itself, the actual practical aspect of that, but we could talk about that later. Wonderful. Have a great evening.